Are you good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What a gentleman. So, <laughs> oops, sorry. When you're here. Um, you need to be, so, so we've got our ligaments left. The ligamentous nuchi goes into the supraspinous ligament, okay? And where it goes, the supraspinous ligament goes from spinous process to spinous process, and it doesn't really go on top of the spinous processes, but the ligamentum nuchi is this really thick ligament. It makes it really hard to feel the spinous processes through it. But that's the only difference. It's the same structure. It's connecting the spinous processes. It holds our spine together, okay? But it's basically one structure. The ligamentum nuchi, or yeah, ligamentous nuchi, is really a pain in our butt. It makes our life more difficult and it makes it hard to palpate the structures, but it, there's generally not damage done to that, okay? Um, so you need to be able to palpate the spinous processes and the transverse processes in sitting, supine, and prone. Okay, and you need to figure out which one works best for you. You can imagine that in sitting, it's going to be really a challenge because um, the postural muscles will be tight. Okay, Sitting works as long as they're comfortable. So, Jimmy, I'm going to pick on you just a little bit. You have a fairly forward head posture. <laughs> and so a supine isn't going to work really well for you because... <laughs> <laughs> You're not super comfortable lying on your back flat, right? I mean, yeah. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> okay. But your muscles are pretty tight when you're in that position. So you're someone that might be better to palpate in prone than in supine. Okay? And I'll try not to pick on you again. Okay. Um, at least today. Okay. So um, in sitting, I will show you just a screening technique. Um, for you just to play with, but it's not an entry level skill. And so I'll just show you and I'd like you to play with it to just practice your uh, palpation skills, but it's something that you'll come back to when you get into spine or when you take classes later, okay? So if we look at the spine behind Amy, we don't, thank you Connor, that was lovely. <laughs> we don't really have these prominences for transverse processes, right? We just have these columns of facets. And so when we're palpating what we're calling transverse processes of the cervical spine, you're not going to feel the bony prominences that we're gonna see in the thoracic and lumbar spine. Now, we are going to have the transverse processes and the spinous processes lined up with one another laterally. That's not going to be the case in the thoracic spine. So in the cervical and lumbar spines, everything's gonna line up. So the spinous process and the transverse processes will be across from one another. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get in this thing. Okay, so Christine, what do you have going on? What? <laughs> okay, so, um, I, sorry, I really, I could, this is what I could do all day. This is my jam, is people's necks and backs. And you're taping, so I'm gonna stop there. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, right now we're palpating spinous processes. So what I'm going to do is make a uh, teeter-totter with my hands. I'm probably not gonna put Christine's head in my hand right now, but what I'm gonna do is come in from the side and put my fingers together. And I'm gonna go up against the spinous process and then down, and then I'm gonna go up against the next one and down. And so um, what I'm really feeling for is movement of those spinous, that spinous process, okay? I'm also feeling, um, so I'm actually not on her spinous process, I'm right on the arch on either side. So I'm kind of pinching the spinous process, can you feel that? Mm -hmm. My hands are on either side. Um, and I'm feeling if there's any restriction into that flexion and extension. So um, you also are just a little bit goofy right there. Um, so if I go this way, it's a little bit tight, but if I go that way, mm. there's more there, but there it's, yeah, I'm hitting up against something. Um, and so you're feeling for end feels here, okay? So here, that, just that segment in general. Oh no, you should be tight there too. 
Um, so I'm taking her to the end range of that segment and just feeling what the end range feels like. So I'm not really palpating segments in supine. I'm really getting the motion. What you're going to find is we don't measure past... You've got something weird there, too. I have no flesh. You have what? You I have, have flesh? flesh. Oh, tell me if I'm hurting you. No, I'm, it's just there. Um, so... Um, <laughs> We're not gonna measure passive range of motion of the cervical spine, we're only going to measure active, but we still wanna get that segmental end feel, okay? And so that's what I'm really doing in, um, in supine. Now, if I wanted to palpate transverse processes, you also want to be here. Are you a stomach sleeper? Yeah. <laughs> I am too, I, so I, no judgment. Um, so I'm, Oh, you have really atrocious styloid processes. Who was her partner? Uh, me. John, did you feel her styloid processes? They're really a bummer. Mm -hmm. Why? Okay. Does that <laughs> <mean>? <laughs> <laughs> well, just because you can't get to her C1 because oh. of her styloid processes. So anyone, who could we not find styloid processes on? Chloe. Mm -hmm. Who was, are you her partner? Mm -hmm. Come here. <laughs> so feel right this way. Oh, geez, yeah. Right? Oh, man. They're horrible. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I, I knew it. So, so don't go crazy on Christine's styloid processes, but if you had trouble feeling what they feel like... Yes, you can come here. If, if you had trouble with your partner finding them or feeling them, um, I'm sure that Christine would volunteer her styloid processes for people. Maybe. Just don't go crazy. Just be gentle. Um, but they're really prominent, and you can feel them because they're vertical. Right? Well, horizontal right now. But. So is that something that Chloe doesn't have or you just can't feel? No, so... so Would everyone have that? Everyone has a styloid process. For Chloe, it was that the distance between the ramus of her mandible and her mastoid process was very small. And so her styloid process was tucked behind her mastoid. And so it's really hard to get into that space. Got it. Mm. Um, so even palpating her C1 is going to be tricky. Okay? So it's just how... Her, her jaw and her mastoid are just very close together. Got it. Um, yeah, so there's the tip of your styloid processes. Um, so, so in Christine, I'm having to go pretty far down to be able to press on the um, transverse processes. And what I can do is do lateral flexion by pressing on the transverse processes. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not on C1 anymore, and I... Who was your partner? Yeah. Um, don't don't try to get past her style. Uh, just go inferior to her style processes. Okay, um, so you just won't be able to do C one on her. So you want to make sure you jump onto someone else, like whoever the group of three is. Luke, maybe grab whoever is the third and try to do C one on that person. Okay. Um, so for C one transverse processes, you're going to just have one finger. I usually use my middle finger. I I don't know why. You can use your index finger. But I'm going back and forth. This is tighter than this. Um, getting down lower, I'm going to switch and no longer use my fingertip, but I'm actually going to use um, my second digit, okay? And I'm gonna come in now, I'm still cradling the head, and now I'm pressing here. I'm pressing through her soft tissues to get her neck to move, okay? Again, this is all passive range of motion to feel end feels, but we're not going to measure it. All right? So then we're going along on the other side. Is it the same kind of end feels that we would have felt for the other section? When I was doing the spinous processes. Oh, you mean as far as yeah. muscular mm -hmm. and, yeah, and capsular. You would expect them to be capsular. What you're going to find is a lot more asymmetry. Um, you'll feel it moves freely on one side, but not on the other, because we have those um, apophyseal joints on either side and you can have one side that's restricted while the other side is moving maybe too much okay or you can have one one segment that's locked on both sides and then you'll feel too much motion above or below I was saying to a group in the front the fascinating thing about the spine in particular is that we're a stack of blocks and so if you find a segment that's either moving too much or too little there's going to be some other segment above or below that that's doing the exact opposite because the net sum will be pretty equivalent motion. So if you find an area that's not moving correctly, you're gonna find another area above or below it that's compensating for that, okay? All right, so that said, I'm gonna have you sit up for me if you don't mind. Yeah, sure.
to what I was doing with Christine in supine, um, you can do in sitting as far as testing motion, okay? Um, so I'm just gonna get right up here. I am now going to have my thumb on one side of her spine and my index finger on the other side of her spine. So the spinous processes are gonna be right in that web space of both sides, okay? So I'm gonna come in like this, and what I'm gonna be feeling for is movement under my hand. So I'm gonna take my other hand, and I'm just gonna do slight motions, and I'm gonna slide my hand down. And then when I get here, I'm actually gonna keep going. Um, okay, so at least going to her right, Christine moved pretty well through her cervical spine, but as soon as I got to her upper thoracic, she kind of went bonk and didn't move anymore. And if we look at her spine, her upper thoracic spine is very, very flat, right? Okay, so now I'm gonna go to the other side. And it's not as free on this side, which is what I found when she was in supine as well. So she stops moving all the way up there. But do you see it's not a large movement? I just want you to play with this and see what you can feel, okay? Now the movements get a little bit larger as we go down because I'm locking the spine all the way down to my hand. Are you feeling spinous processes? I'm feeling the spinous processes pressing up against my thumb and against my index finger. So and, um, but I'm doing all the rotation with that opposite hand. So you're okay. rotating her thoracic spine. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm starting all the way at her cervical and moving her head. And then as soon as I get to here, then I switch over to her shoulder. Um, the common mistake that students make is they're doing this motion. Well, that motion's coming way down here. And so if my hand's up here, I'm blowing way past my hand and what I can feel. Okay. Now, one of the things that you're always going to want to be able to find is C7. C7 is going to be a landmark for some of our goniometric tests. T1, what is different from about T1 and C7? So we've got seven cervical vertebra. Yep, so we start to have transverse processes, absolutely. And why, what is significant about the transverse processes in the thoracic spine, of which we happen to have 12? Ribs. Ribs. So T1 is not going to move with flexion and extension because we're going to have our first rib attaching to T1. Um, C7 is our last vertebra that doesn't have a, a rib attached to it. And so we want to find C7 by flexing and extending the neck and feeling C7 is going to move with those motions, but T1 is not going to move. Do you follow that logic? So, Christine, I'm going to have you scoot to the end here. Good. So, I'm going to palpate with a flat hand, right, over her neck. Now, what's misleading is for some of you, you're going to have a big knob on the back, and you're going to go, oh, that's C7. It could either be C7, T1, or T2. Everyone has a little bit of variation in there. So, go ahead and put your hand flat. I'm just gonna grab your noggin and move it around a little bit, but go ahead and let me move it, okay? Okay, so it happens to be right under her strap is the one that doesn't move, or does move. So this one is, oh, perfect, thank you. So, so as she moves, this one doesn't move, so this one is T1. If I come up right above that, it disappears when I extend, and it's prominent when I flex. So that's going to be C7. That's going to be one you want to mark. We're going to use it when we do measurements of torso motions. We're also going to use it as our axis for our goniometric measurements of the neck. Okay, so being able to find C7 is going to be important. All right, now I'm going to have you lie on your stomach. Um, I'm going to have you put this under your belly. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and have you just put one hand up if you don't mind. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Now, for palpating the 
the spine, it's going to be super important that the spine be neutral. So you can't have someone with their head turned off to the side. You really need to have that neutral spine. Now, have, do you all know your um, dominant eye? Yes. Okay, so if you don't, you wanna make a circle with both hands, find something like the projector and put it in that circle with both eyes open, close one eye, and then close the other eye, and the eye in which the object stays in the circle when it's open is your dominant eye. Okay, you have to use both hands to get it. <laughs> so I'm right eye dominant, and so I'm going to stand so that my right eye is over her. Okay, so um, it really becomes most important when we're palpating the spine. Um, for the cervical spine, I might actually want to be on that other side so that I'm, I have my dominant eye. Because we're going to be palpating, if a segment is rotated, when we palpate the transverse processes in the thoracic spine, we're going to be looking for one to be more posterior than the other. Okay, that's going to tell us something about the alignment of the spine. And you want to have your dominant eye over the spine when you're doing that. Okay. All right. So... C1 does not have a spinous process, so we're not going to palpate spinous process of C1. So what you're going to do is find the base of the occiput, and then you're going to palpate, and you're going to feel the first prominence, and that's going to be C2 for spinous process. And then you're going, you're always going to keep a finger on your landmark that you have. So if that's C2, then the, right below that is C3, and below that is C4. Okay, now remember we have that ligamentous nuchae, which is gonna be hard to palpate through. Um, so now I've got two, three, four, so I can keep going down. Five, six, seven, okay, and then T1. So if you need to palpate a spinous process um, high up, you're gonna start from the spine and go down. If you think the person has a lower cervical problem, you're gonna find C7 and sitting, and you're gonna start there and work your way up, okay? So that's how you're gonna palpate the spinous processes in the cervical spine. Now, I've told you not to try not to palpate with your um, thumbs. When I am looking at symmetry of the spinous processes, I do use my thumbs, and I'm, again, I'm looking to see if one is more posterior than another. That will tell me that a segment is rotated. In the cervical spine, we're gonna have our thumbs about one inch apart, okay? When we get down to the low back, we're gonna have our fingers much wider to find those transverse processes. Now remember that in the cervical spine, there's really not anything you're going to feel um, as far as a transverse process. There's gonna be little nubs that you can feel. So you're better off finding a spinous process and then going lateral to that, okay? And you're gonna work your way down. Now you're not going to palpate the transverse process of C1 this way either. The way to palpate the spinous process of C1 is to come in anterior to the mastoid process. Okay, so a prone approach is going to be C2 and lower. Okay, so go ahead and palpate. One, just play with range of motion in supine and in sitting, but the way that you're gonna palpate the actual structures is going to be in prone, most likely. Okay? All right, let's go.